Well, that spring game was something. Let's talk about it on this live reaction edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome to this live reaction edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. I'm Andrew Line, the host of this podcast, and also a staff writer for Gamecock Digest over on Fan Nation. Thank you all so much for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first listen or watch for your team here today. We are free and available both on YouTube and wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side, and it is a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play Store. Shane Beamer and South Carolina's football team concluded spring practice on Saturday night with their annual Garnet and Black spring game. And I have to say, uh, there wasn't necessarily a lot of fireworks that took place in this contest. The Garnet team wound up winning, of course, 17 to nothing. But that doesn't mean that there are no takeaways to be had from this game. So we're going to dive into all of that and what the team might have to look forward to and what they need to work on all throughout the end of the show. So let's start off with the biggest storyline coming into this game, which was the fact that this was the first time in his Gamecock career that Lenore Sellers was going out on the field as unofficially South Carolina's starting quarterback. Obviously, everyone assumes right now that Lenore Sellers is going to be quarterback one when the Gamecocks take the field later this September. And I got to say, Lenore Sellers, um, he looked the part. He did not look overwhelmed in the slightest bit. I thought he made a lot of really good decisions. Did not try to put the ball in a lot of tight windows. Basically took what the defense was giving him. And that's kind of something that I wanted to see coming out of this game. Because, again, we all saw last year that Lenore Sellers obviously has the ability to create highlight-type plays every time he goes out there on the field. But what's going to win you games is if you could do all the little things right as well. And I thought Lenore Sellers did do that for the most part. I liked how he navigated the pocket. I liked the fact that when he did take off running, he did not take off running laterally. He worked up in the pocket, found an open hole, and worked his way at least somewhat down the field until he could find open grass. And it led to him rushing for around 40 yards in the first half, the only half of football that he played throughout the entire night. I thought Lenore Sellers, quite frankly, was the best player out there on the football field on Saturday night. And obviously, it's not a bad thing when your quarterback is going to come home with those honors coming out of this game. So Lenore Sellers, yeah. He looked great, and if I had to say right now, yeah, there's no question, he is the starting quarterback for South Carolina heading into this fall. Now, unfortunately, with the wide receivers and tight ends, not a whole lot you could take away from those guys because of the fact that, quite frankly, the offense just did not push the ball down the field very much in this contest. Dow Loggins, again, he gave everyone a heads up on Thursday when he talked to the media, and he said, listen, it's going to be like plain vanilla ice cream. You're not going to get a whole lot in terms of, you know, shot plays and the like. And he wound up sticking to his word in that regard. So not a whole lot you could say about that group. I did think that Maisie O'Bennett made a really nice catch over the middle of the field when he caught, I want to say it was kind of like a mid slant route or short crossing route from Robbie Ashford at one point in the first half. And Maurice Brown, walk-on tight end. I thought he made a really nice play in the second half, catching that ball from Dante Reno, contorting his body to catch the ball, and then turning up field and getting his way into the end zone with what wound up being only the uh, the second touchdown of the night and the last touchdown of the night at the same time. So uh, those two guys made some good plays, and I also liked what I saw from the rest of the guys as well. The group on offense that is going to have to improve 
heading into this next season still, it's the offensive line. And listen, I could just tell by looking at the groups that were out there that even though this staff clearly tried to do a better job of letting these guys kind of play along guys that they had been alongside with throughout spring practice, in essence, having whole units go out there instead of just having them draft individual players, kind of screwing with the uh, with the cohesiveness of those groups. I thought the offensive line did not look very good. I'll just flat out say it. Um, I thought pass protection was decent from the starting group. I thought that they did overall a solid job at least giving Lenore Sellers a chance to work in the pocket. I thought that the backup units, however, didn't do so hot. I thought the inside run game, quite frankly, wasn't all that great. And granted, obviously, it's not going to look quite as good when you don't have your starter out there in Rocket Sanders. But in terms of a blocking standpoint, whether it was the interior D line and the depth that they have or a lack of progression from the offensive line units, didn't see a whole lot of push in the middle. And if you're going to win games in the SEC, again, it's hard to just run to the perimeter every single time because these coaches in the SEC are smart enough and they're good enough that at some point they're going to account for that. You've got to be able to attack defenses in multiple ways on the ground. And uh, if you can't even run up the gut, then that's a problem. So South Carolina got to get better in that regard still. And perimeter blocking from wide receiver units. I didn't think that that looked all that great as well. Now, again, this is an initial reaction. It might sound a bit harsh. I might go back and watch this game, and I might sit back and say, you know what? Maybe it was a bit strong with my take coming out of the game the first time around. So I'm more than willing to acknowledge that. But just from a first glance, offensive line is going to still be a issue in 2024. And I don't think that any of us expected this group to make massive strides heading into this fall, but if they're going to make it back to a bowl game, they've got to improve. I will say it was noticeable to me that in that first group that went out there with the North sellers, Josiah Thompson was the left tackle. He was going up against guys like a Kyle Kennard, like a Dylan Stewart. Well, I'll talk about more in a couple of minutes. And ESPN, they had obviously some updated uh, weight numbers for some of these guys. They pulled up Josiah Thompson's uh, like personal profile bar, and it said that he already weighs 300 pounds. That's a pretty big jump for him because I recall from his high school recruiting profiles, depending on where you looked, he weighed about 280, 285 maybe going into his senior year of high school football. So maybe he had put on some weight this past fall, and now it's kind of catching up with the updated rosters that obviously South Carolina is going to have every so often. But it, it's clear that Thompson is making the effort. He's trying to put on good weight, could really tell in his upper body, especially with his arms, that he has put on some weight. And it still looks like he's moving around quite well. Obviously, again, probably can't play at 300, still got to add a little bit more but he's got the summertime to do all that. So those are my takeaways with the offense. And look, with how much the offensive line has got to get better, I will say this. I think there's reason to be excited about what this defensive front could do for South Carolina in 2024. We'll talk about that a bit more in a couple moments right here on Locked on Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've all been there, either as a player or a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low, not sure you or your team can pull out a win. And that's when you dig deep, lift your head up and say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank kites and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do on the Monopoly Go app. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. You can make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball, and you can charge other players rent for your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there, put your game face on, and download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play Store.
Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience is the formula for winning championships and also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die at ebaymotors.com. Um, eligible items only exclusions apply ebay guaranteed fit is only available to u.s customers welcome back to this live reaction edition of the locked on gamecocks podcast where we cover your south carolina gamecocks every single day and as always a big thank you to each and every one of you every dares who make the locked on gamecocks podcast your daily choice for south carolina gamecocks sports coverage Let's talk a little bit about the defense now. And let's start off with the guy that a lot of fans were looking forward to the most as far as his Gamecock debut, and that was edge rusher Dylan Stewart. Dylan made a couple of highlight-type plays on a Saturday night, got a really big run stop against Sidney Fugar, where he basically did a simple dip and rip on the inside half of Fugar and just beat him right off the line of scrimmage, ran right up through the gut and made a tackle right there in the backfield. Also had another play in pass rush where he went up against right tackle Case and Henry, who is now, I believe, going to his third year in the program. And Dylan Stewart had kind of been struggling a bit on that drive against Henry. He eventually had a play where he just said, you know what, I've had enough of this. He threw Henry back like a rag doll on the ensuing play and got right up in Robbie Ashford's grill and took him down for a sack, at least figuratively took him down for a sack. They were non-contact jerseys. You get the overall point. Got credit for the sack on that drive. So point being with Dylan Stewart, he is going to make some big plays for this defense this fall. Again, y'all, the athletic traits and the ceiling is there. The only thing that Dylan Stewart has to do is continue to try to add to his pass rushing moves so that guys cannot just key on a couple of different things and then basically lock them up in that regard. And then obviously make sure that he continues to work on his technique and rush defense. I will say, I thought he did a great job of maintaining gap integrity and staying home, not over pursuing. But again, also coming from an initial impression of the spring game, I can go back and watch it again and just watch him and maybe point out a few things where I could say he could do a little bit better in that regard. So I would say more than likely, he probably did make a couple of mistakes, but folks, Dylan Stewart, he's going to see the field a lot this year. I promise you, even if he's not listed as a starter, that kid's going to find the field. And he's going to be probably a reason why there are game-changing drives that happen in certain moments this year for South Carolina. As far as the defensive front goes as a whole, I do think that pass rush is going to be a little bit better. I think that getting Kyle Kennard from Georgia Tech was one of the more underrated transfer portal moves in the SEC this offseason. Kennard, again, doesn't have the athleticism of Dylan Stewart. Not very many do, but I think that with his work ethic as a pass rusher, the savviness, the experience that he brings, I think he's going to help them out in that regard. Was highly impressed with the interior defensive line. Listen, Shane Beamer admitted that this past season, they basically rotated between three, four guys on the interior D-line. And I can just tell you as a former D-line myself, only playing high school ball, but I can, I promise you, I can tell you from experience, it's not fun playing interior D-line against solid competition when there's only three or four of you going in in the rotation. You've got to have more bodies than that in this conference. So Shane Beamer stuck to his word, went out there, got a guy in DeAndre Jules from Pittsburgh, got a Monkel Goodwine from Alabama. Both of those guys made plays on Saturday night. So I definitely think that guys like Boogie Huntley, Taka Hemingway, TJ Sanders, 
I don't think that they're going to be used up quite as much this next season. I think there'll be a lot more times where, hey, if a drive is extended, you're getting a little bit winded, tap your helmet. We've got a guy ready to go in for you, and the drop-off is not going to be significant. Okay? So the interior D-line, listen, it might not sound like a lot, but it is going to help this defense out tremendously if they can get more production out of that group this coming fall. Now, the guy that, in my opinion, stood out the most on the defensive side of the ball on Saturday night was linebacker Demetrius Knight Jr., I am really excited to see this guy go out here and play for the Gamecocks this fall. Honestly, in terms of just strictly positional upgrades, I don't think there was a bigger upgrade made, honestly, than at the linebacker position getting a guy like Demetrius Knight. Experienced, but the key here is this guy is an athlete. This guy can cover ground. He can move sideline to sideline. And I'd swanee. Early on in the first quarter, there was a three or four play sequence where Demetrius Knight Jr. either assisted in bringing the ball carrier down or brought him down by himself. And that was both cutting off a running lane ahead of time and also pursuing the ball carrier from behind. This guy, in my opinion, I'll go ahead and make the bold pr prediction right now. Demetrius Knight is going to lead this team in tackles this year. I am fully confident in that happening. I think that Debo Williams, it's going to be made a lot easier for him this year because let's let, let's just go ahead and say Debo, everybody loves him. He loves playing the game of football, hard-nosed, heavy hitter. Debo is a guy that is perfect in the box. Once you take Debo Williams, though, out of the box and now you're asking him to run sideline to sideline to try to chase guys down, that's not exactly his forte. He's going to give it 110% effort. Don't worry about that part, but that's just not Debo Williams' game. Demetrius Knight Jr., he's going to have no issue doing that. He can basically say, hey, Debo, it's okay. I got it. You, you just watch for the cutback if he goes back the other way. I'll go run this way, cover the strong side, and I'll be sure that this guy gets brought down. Wendell Gregory made some good plays out there, has a high motor, I'm very excited about this linebacker group. I truly believe that this group has been significantly upgraded from a depth standpoint and from a speed and athleticism standpoint. Very excited to see what those guys are going to do. In terms of the defensive backfield, um, not really a whole lot you could say about those guys either. Got to be honest, it's very hard to have takeaways when you're trying to watch it from a broadcast angle um, on ESPN+. Plus. So all I will say is this. Carry over some of my thoughts from the spring going into the summertime. Safety position, I mean, come on. You don't need to worry about that spot. You're super deep at that position. Nick Emmonworry, DQ Smith, Jalon Kilgore, now Kelvin Hunter. List goes on and on and on. You have loaded that position. No problems there. Cornerback continues to be a position where, personally, I think that there's still reason to be concerned. You got O'Donnell Fortune coming back. Again, I do think that that is significant. And I think O'Donnell Fortune can definitely handle being maybe a number one corner. But he's got to have somebody step up next to him. So I don't know who that's going to be. There's plenty of candidates for that cornerback two spot. But we'll have to wait and see, I think, throughout the summer. I think, quite honestly, that is a position that will not probably be figured out until, say, week four or five. In the regular season, I think it might take almost a whole month into the year before the coaches finally decide on who's going to start alongside O'Donnell Fortune. So those are my overall thoughts on how the spring game unfolded. When we come back in a couple moments, I'll give y'all kind of my final takeaway and what I think this team needs to focus on going into the rest of the off season. We'll dive into all of that in a few moments right here on Locked on Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier than before. <laughs> Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. You can save up to 60% off buying last minute tickets for games at the ballpark. The Atlanta Braves are playing the Texas Rangers right now in Atlanta, and game three of the series will take place 
tomorrow night, Sunday night, at 7.10 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The cool part about this game is this. Firstly, you can find tickets as cheap as $8 in the grandstand sections in Truist Park. And also, if you bring your kid to the ballpark and your kid is one of the first 3,000 kids to get in the ballpark, you can get a blooper chain. Blooper, obviously, is the mascot of the Atlanta Braves. Great account on X, by the way. So you can bring your kid out, good ball game against the Texas Rangers, and get a blooper chain while you're at it at the same time. You can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N. C-O-L-L-E-G-E for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome back to this live edition of the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast. We cover your team every single day in just 30 minutes. All right, final thoughts and takeaways from the Garnet and Black Spring game. We'll start off with the offensive side of the ball. I think that you have your quarterback in Lenore's Sellers. Okay, listen, don't care what the coaches say about there being a quarterback competition. And Robbie Ashford, he still might have a role in the offense this coming fall. Lenore Sellers is right now your most dynamic playmaker on that side of the ball. He is your starting quarterback. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. At the wide receiver position, listen, um, I mentioned this when they got guys like Gage Larvidane and Amari Huggins-Bruce this offseason that these guys uh, were small on paper. And obviously, not trying to poke fun at that, but at receiver, you do want to have a couple bigger bodies. And when I watched this game on television, yeah, the guys looked every bit of about 5'10", 5'11", 170, 180-something pounds. You can work with having one or two of those guys in your rotation. But when you're having those guys starting for you, or again, at the very least rotating in every so often, and you're going against SEC defensive backs, I don't think that's ideal. I think that Shane Beamer and the staff, I think you need to go and get one or two more wideouts and get some guys that are actually six foot or taller. Just get some bigger bodies in that room because that can lead to injury this fall. Um, so I hope that that's something the staff's going to look into offensive line wise. Listen, just continue to try to work and get some continuity with that group, figure out a starting five. Um, I don't think you necessarily need to parse through all the depth in that position group to try and figure out who your best five linemen are. I'm sure you could probably already name three or four of them off the top of your heads. Um, just figure out the starting five and roll with that going into fall camp and let those guys get as many reps as humanely possible before you take the field week one against the old Dominion Monarchs, okay? Don't mess around with it. Just figure out the starting five. Let them get the reps. Don't split up all the reps between guys that, let's be honest, are not going to see the field, okay? So figure that out with your offensive line. Defensively speaking, Clayton White has a real chance for a redemption arc here. I mean, a lot of Gamecock fans wanted Clayton White gone last season. Quite frankly, for a good amount of the season, the defense uh, wasn't really helping him out in terms of their performance. And you could definitely say a lot of that was maybe due to coaching, maybe stubbornness with game planning. But this defense has a chance to turn a corner in 2024. I'm not going to say top 25 defense or anything like that. Let's just let's start off with a baby step. Let's go with, say, a top 60, top 50 defense. At least be dead average compared to the rest of your peers at the FBS level. If you could do that, then this team could absolutely go bowling again in 2024. I like this defensive front. I do think that, again, the edge rusher group is better. I think the interior D-line is better. I think the linebacker core is better. I think, quite frankly, you have upgraded in some facet in every single position group in your defensive front. So that group should not get pushed around as much this coming fall. That should not happen. I envision this group getting a lot more three and outs. I envision this group being able to withstand long extended drives to a much more efficient degree in 2024. You don't have to be the fire ant defense of 1984. 
Gamecock fans aren't asking for that. Just go out there and don't make it to where Lenore Sellers in the offense has to go out and pretty much score almost every given possession a la a 2014. Gosh knows that was a nightmarish unit to watch. Nobody wants to see that again. And I don't think that's going to happen. I think that this defense is definitely bound for improvement. Um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about special teams to cap off the show because why not? I mean, Shane Beamer's the head coach. You better talk a little bit about Beamer ball if you're going to talk about the football team. Uh, it looks like place kicker battle is still going on. Alex Herrera, I know, got about a 55-yard field goal attempt in this game, and he did miss it. Now, in fairness to Alex, uh, he's been dealing with a heel injury all spring. Joe DiCamillis did make that known, I think, this past week in a press conference. So Alex deserves at least a little bit of leniency in that regard because he's missed some time. And apparently there was also a miscue before the kick even took place, according to Shane Beamer on the live mic that SEC Network had him on. So it seems like that they're still trying to work things out there. Peyton Argent got a chance to kick a 22-yarder and uh, clanked it off the upright from the left hash mark on the right upright. So literally straight across almost. But look, again, it's a spring game. First time kicking in front of, you know, a live crowd. So it's a work in progress right now. But obviously, you know, you've had a great run of kickers at South Carolina the last several years. And that's a position that can win or lose you football games. So you do need to figure that out with Mitch Jeter leaving the program. Honestly, again, that might have been the most impactful loss. I mean, okay, maybe not most impactful. Juice Wells leaving, that was probably the most impactful because that really hurt your receiving core. But right behind him probably was Mitch Jeter. So got to figure that out. But good thing is you do have more time for those guys to practice during the summer. And... Again, with Joe DiCamillis being on staff, Shane Beamer and his special teams skill set that he possesses, how how much experience he has in that facet, I think that they're going to be just fine in that regard. So with that being said, that's going to do it for this live reaction edition of the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast. I hope you all thoroughly enjoyed this show. As always, give me your thoughts on the spring game. What are your thoughts on Lenore Sellers, the offensive line? What do you think of the defensive front? And what are you looking forward to for this team in the 2024 season? Let me know in the comments section on YouTube or shoot me a direct message on X at a lion underscore SC. Again, Thank y'all so much for tuning in. Have a great rest of your night, and I'll be sure to catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.